Uh, we're joined uh, today by Professor John Kelly. He's a professor of uh, National Security Studies at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And um, about a week ago, Professor Kelly uh, spoke with a delegation of uh, senior African military officers uh, attending the next generation of African security sector professionals uh, here at, uh, uh, in, in Alexandria, uh, Virginia. And uh, we're going to uh, have a conversation about uh, certain, about key themes uh, that you discussed um, in, your, in your lecture, uh, and we'll just go over uh, a few questions. Uh, the first question is, um, you know, why should African uh, military leaders and the African uh, professional military establishment uh, be prioritizing uh, rule of law uh, and ethics? No, it's, it's a very good question. Um, what it comes down to is, that when you get to establishing a set of behaviors for any organization, it's all dependent upon the leadership. And the ethical standards of the leadership does permeate the rest of that organization. Rule of law is important because it's the foundation for both, uh, I think, a uniformed service in terms of what is required of them both domestically and internationally, as well as, I think, the perceptual question for those who are interacting uh, to know that they're going to be circumscribed by certain behavior. So rule of law is a critical component, uh, especially for uh, the uniformed services, because uh, most African forces are going to be called upon to deploy abroad, uh, either for peacekeeping operations or in domestic operations that cross over the borders. And what you're going to do is you're going to have an expectation of people in other countries that they are going to be professionals. And by being professional, I mean that there are certain codes of conduct, there are certain activities that they know that they have to abide by. Uh, for example, human rights or the laws of war or the treatment of civilians or the protection of civilians. Um, all of those things are expectations on, on both the part of the citizens where they're going to be deployed or where they're stationed and there's something that the troops have to understand from the very first day that they become part of the security apparatus. As soon as they come in, they should begin the inculcation process of, of rule of law so that they know that the norms that have been established by legislatures, by the international conventions, by those who they come in contact with, are going to be a set of behaviors and a set of activities that are going to be limited in, in terms of their contact with civilians. Right, you talk about uh, a set of behaviors yes. uh, that is absolutely necessary uh, in terms of uh, leadership. Uh, you know, just looking at the continent, uh, looking at the uh, 54 countries of the African continent, are there any uh, positive um, examples uh, that you're able to uh, discuss? I, yes, I mean, it's a very good question. I think what has arose in just the last couple of years during the Arab Spring was the fact that you had uh, governments in Libya, Tunisia, and Egypt, which were not abiding by the rule of law, and they, people have seen and witnessed the chaos that followed. The movement on the part of the Libyans to develop, I think, a working constitution, the Tunisians and the Egyptians are in a very formative early stage, but at least that's the, the concept that they put out is that they're going to embrace rule of law. If you look at what took place in terms of the separation of Sudan, uh, into South Sudan and the northern uh, provinces, what you have is a circumstance where, again, people have looked to legal institutions to resolve a conflict. If you look at what's taking place in the elections in Kenya, the elections in five or six countries in this last year where there has been a democratic transition of the government according to law, it connotes and, and sends a signal to the international community and to people inside the country that the whimsical behavior of certain leaders in the past is gone. And so there's a, a better expectation on the part of people who are willing to invest. There is a peace and security from the citizenry uh, in the sense that the law enforcement people and the security people are no longer going to abuse their mandates. And I think it creates an, an environment which is much better for growth and prosperity. Right, um, for growth and pros uh, prosperity. That, that takes me back to 
something that you highlighted uh, in your presentation when you spoke with the, uh, with the senior officers, you talked about the new partnership for African development. You talked about the African Conference on uh, Elections and Democracy that was held in Pretoria. Uh, you also talked about the African Court uh, for Human and People's Rights. Yes. Should we understand these initiatives to, to mean that a new normative framework uh, concerning hum human rights and the rule of law is beginning to emerge on the African continent? Yes, and I think that the main thrust of that was that even the United States is a very young country at 225. Um, but what you have for many African countries, are, they're 50 years into um, establishing a legal framework. I mean, we didn't have a constitution in this country for almost uh, 20 years after the revolution began, um, more than 20 years. And so really what you're looking at is a comparative uh, evolution of legal structures and behaviors that I think have been uh, made even clearer since the end of the Cold War. Now, during the Cold War, you had major superpowers using proxies and surrogates uh, in Africa, and there was always a justification on each side as to why they did not subscribe to the rule of law. Since that time, since the, the mid-90s, what we've seen is that most um, constitutional processes in Africa have become more refined, elections and electoral fairness has become the standard, uh, even though there are great abuses to that and there is a, still a great deal of fraud, just like there is in this country, um, what you have is a circumstance where there is that normative framework evolving in Africa, and that's a very positive development. Right. What, uh, what would you say are the main uh, challenges uh, moving forward? The biggest challenge, I think, and, and it's something that we're facing worldwide, it's not just in, in Africa, but it's, it's the problem of corruption. Uh, the fact that people who have positions of authority, people who have positions of power, are abusing that by taking payoffs and skewing what should be a fair process. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take before we come up with some real solutions to that problem. Uh, perhaps a, a fair way of treating with civil servants or maybe more transparency in terms of how government operates or maybe some international standards on the part of uh, investors or donor countries that can lay out what has to happen with the handling of certain decisions or money, but really it, it is the biggest impediment to the evolution of democracy on the continent and actually is, is quite pervasive uh, worldwide. Right. Um, how would, uh, you know, given the uh, complexities, um, uh, how best would uh, uh, United States policy uh, be leveraged uh, to support the emergence of these types of institutions that you've been talking about, uh, the rule of law, uh, the culture of constitutionalism that you stressed when you spoke to uh, the African military officers that are here uh, attending this program? Uh, how best should the U.S. Uh, leverage its assistance in this regard? Well, I think uh, the U.S. is a major investor in Africa. I think the number one is China. I think we're second, and then you get to the uh, Europeans and then the South Asians. But really what it comes down to is taking that power in terms of financial investment and treatment with various governments and saying this is what, th this is the kind of behavior that we expect. We don't expect to provide a hundred million dollars in aid and have 80 million of it leave the country in Swiss bank accounts. It means that that requires greater monitoring on the part of the international community, the international banking and the financial community it also requires, I think, what the, the basis of your question is, building, actually having uh, uh, a state institutions begin to build the kinds of ethics and normative behavior that you want to see. And we do that through, we try to do that through the Department of Defense here at the Africa Center by bringing professionalism courses to the military and, and doing it based on the fact that there are some, some fundamental standards that I think most militaries around the world embrace and, and trying to convince people that that's important for them too. So it, that capacity building uh, within military institutions, I think if you put about, you know, put in a greater transparency for procurement policies, weapons systems, for example, for the military, if you looked at um, the fact that in terms of providing assistance, like we provide um, uh, military education, training, uh, that what we, there would be required to be competency testing for people who evolve through the ranks and get to the highest ranks of, of the, these, the militaries that we're working with. All of those things, I think, would begin to build a, a process where people would say that they're 
permanently, institutionally changing the values within the country. Thank you, uh, Professor. Now, uh, uh, one final question. Uh, yesterday, uh, we spent the day in uh, Gettysburg, mm. uh, the Gettysburg uh, military uh, site, uh, where the uh, the battle took place. Yes. Uh, this turning point in, in American history. And I had the privilege of speaking uh, with many military officers that were there. Um, and, uh, you know, the discussion came down to leadership. Yes. Uh, and it also came down to um, uh, to many of the issues that you raised in your presentation, including uh, constitutionalism. Now, in the context of that experience, which clearly um, was a major, uh, um, you know, you know, a major takeaway uh, uh, by these military officers, uh, we've seen a proliferation of uh, military academies mm. on the continent, yes. of national defense uh, academies, national defense universities. In terms of um, uh, the educational content, uh, do you see an opportunity for uh, institutions like ACSS uh, to, uh, to provide curriculum uh, development uh, to ensure that uh, these uh, uh, cultures and uh, principles uh, that you're talking about are embedded in the educational content of these institutions? Well, I mean, there's a great hope that the African Military Educational Program, AMEP, which uh, was authorized last year by the Department of Defense, We'll provide exactly that. We'll provide the faculty and the curriculum development work so that African militaries can be, uh, according to international standards, can be competent institutions to train their officers for professional purposes. So I, I see, I, I, my understanding is that the first year is going to be six. There are going to be six of these uh, interactions. And again, what it really is going to depend upon is the how well the host governments um, embrace this challenge and make it uh, a, a requirement for their officers, make it a requirement for people that they embrace these professional standards. And if you do that the way we've done that in the U.S. military, there's very structured ways for you to be promoted or get into particular jobs. And if, if that can be inculcated, and I think you see that in, in most other major countries too, um, if that can be inculcated and brought to the officer corps, and then they can demonstrate on their own the initiative to exercise leadership within their organizations, you will slowly change this, these institutions over time. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Professor Kelly, thank you very, very much.